You can, I don't know if you need me to be in camera or off camera. Okay, I tend to wander as I talk a little bit. Thank you so much for coming to listen to me talk today. I love getting out and teaching people. Actually, my current practice is elder law, estate planning, and post-death issues, substitute decision making. Um, but I do have quite an extensive background in um, the employment law arena. So I, I have been the mother of a person with a disability in the workplace. I have been the uh, corporate counsel and human resource director for a nonprofit organization managing our work staff who take care of people who um, have disabilities. And also, um, I was an employment and labor defense attorney for a little while, representing companies whose employees were suing them and, um, and writing handbooks for companies uh, about what type of policies they should have in place um, for um, their workers and how di the workers' disability rights impact their business. And currently, I'm a small business owner. I have my own law firm and several employees, many of whom have disabilities. So I have a, a many different perspectives of how I approach um, disability rights in the workplace. And there are different types of disability rights. There are different laws and there are different people and there are different types of companies. And so we have the person with the disability in the workplace and there are lots of laws that protect the person with the disability in the workplace. There are no laws that protect the caregiver of the person with the disability in the workplace specifically. Those are all just piggybacked onto the laws of the person um, uh, the, the rights of the person with the disability or some other protected characteristic. So there's no disability protection law for a caregiver in and of itself. Um, um, with, it, with some minimal exceptions of how the Family Medical Leave Act works. Um, but that's not, re and, that, and that is a protection. <coughs> and, it's an, and it is an important protection. The laws that we're going to cover a little bit, and we have, you know, we could talk for four hours on in labor and employment law, rights in the workplace. We have an, uh, only about 45 minutes, and I'm going to try to leave you time for questions so that you can get um, answers to the issues that actually are important to you today. And we're, so we're going to talk about the Family and Medical Leave Act, the Federal, um, the Americans with Dis Disabilities Act, and then we're going to talk about the Iowa Act too. And the difference between the Iowa Civil Rights Act is it's sort of a, um, it's the Americans with Disabilities Act mini version. Basically, every state has their own, but it applies to smaller employers than what the um, Federal Americans with Disability Act covers. So whether or not your employer is covered depends on the size of your employer. Whether or not you are covered depends on whether or not you are a key employee. So key employees um, uh, have less uh, rights because a key employee is that to the company, a key employee. And there's this give and take between the employee's rights and the employer's rights to have their employees show up at work. And then there are some exceptions. So teachers, flight attendants are limited protectors on protections under the FMLA for people who have certain types of jobs. So um, first, I would just like to dispel, dispel a very large myth, and that is everybody who talks about HIPAA, oh, HIPAA privacy, HIPAA privacy, we're so afraid about HIPAA privacy. In, in fact, there is no private right of action. You, you people, if somebody divulges your personal medical information, you cannot sue anybody for a HIPAA violation. You have no right to do that. You can complain to the federal government and they will investigate and if they decide to sue or sanction your doctor or whoever it was that divulged your personal uh, health information, they can, but you as a person under HIPAA have no rights to do that. There are other privacy rights that you may have some rights to, but HIPAA is not the one. And not all employers are covered under HIPAA. So HIPAA covers health care providers. Insurance companies that offer health care, health care providers, and it, and it only really applies to your employees or to your employer if your employer has a self-funded insurance plan. Otherwise, it actually really doesn't even apply to your employer at all. And so I was, I was the corporate counsel and human resource director for um, a nonprofit company when HIPAA came out and, um, and involved in SHRM, that's the Society of Human Resource Managers. And there's all this big fuss, oh, we, we, all these employers have to have all these privacy rights, we have to give all these notices to our employees. I'm like, you really don't, because your employer, you're not even a covered entity. All right, medical privacy is important, though. And so um, this is the hard part for us, because we are caregivers. You know, if, if, we're, if you're here in this room, 
it's not only because there's somebody in your family, either you have a, a medical condition or somebody in your family has a medical condition, it's because you care enough to be the one who's the caregiver for the person with the medical information, which makes you a caregiver just in general, that's your personality. And you're wanting to share things and you want to tell your boss, I'm going to be late for work because my husband, my wife, my brother, whoever it is you're taking care of has this or that medical issue. Or I, I have this or that medical issue because your boss is your friend. It depends on the type of organization that you work for, how large your organization is. But sometimes letting your direct supervisor know, and super, they don't know, they're not supposed to ask. That's, for, that's medical information. They're not supposed to ask and make the decision of is it okay for you to be late? Is it okay to modify your job? Is it okay to, um, for you to be gone? Can you take, can you have this time off or that time off? because of this or that reason. So follow, the most important thing is to follow your company's rules. Your company will have rules, I guarantee you. Somewhere, and there is a handbook that has in it the process for requesting leave under the Family Medical Leave Act. And there's a, the, there are some hurdles that you, um, that your employer can require and should require that you jump through to get protected leave through the Family Medical Leave Act, and that includes um, the documentation from the doctor that says yes there's a medical condition that qualifies and then you have to have that discussion with the HR department or whoever it is in your handbook that it says you should have that discussion with about what types of leave you might need and whether or not your job might need to be modified while you're taking leave. Your employer cannot require you to take, in the early days of HIPAA the, the employers all jumped on board and they said well, if you have to take an hour off to take your spouse to the doctor, you have to take the whole day off. And they can't do that. They, you only are required to take the amount of leave off that you actually need to take care of the medical problem that you have. So if you only need one hour of leave for that day and then you're gonna come back to work, they can't require you to take more than that. Unless you're a flight attendant, I mean, how can you, you know, or a teacher. So there are certain jobs that are exempt from those intermittent leave rules. But read your, your employee manual, that information should be in there also of how do they manage their, their absence program under the um, Family Medical Leave Act. And um, how much time are you, what time increments is it that they will allow you to take. And uh, let's see, I'm not very good at following my slides. So, um, so who, so don't, and be careful about providing your medical information to people who don't really need to know. And the people who need to know, and I say that, but we're not all gonna, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna tell everybody everybody anyway, cause that's what we do. But in some ways you really are protecting your employer by not telling everybody, because it's hard to make a, it's easy to defend a discrimination claim. When an employee files a discrimination claim, it's easy to defend it if you can credibly say, I didn't know. If you can't say, I didn't know, it's much harder to defend. Okay, so what does the Americans with Disabilities Act do? It prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability or affiliation um, with a person with a disability. And so affiliation could mean that, well, what does that mean? It means you're the parent, you're the spouse, you're the person who's in charge of caring for that person. And, and what types of discrimination could fall under, under this? How could you be discriminated against because you're affiliated with a person with a disability? And the EEOC has provided us with some examples. And if you go, there's way more information. There's a lot of information online. So if you're, if you're not somebody who's very familiar with a keyboard and a computer, my really um, advice is get familiar with a computer and a keyboard because in today's age of technology, there is so much information out there for you to become self-educated. And the, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission publishes these fact sheets on all different types of workplace issues. So the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission is the federal agency that sort of oversees workplace rights. There's also the Department of, of, um, uh, Department of Justice that also is kind of oversees the, at a, at a little higher level, the employment um, um, arena. And so, for example, refusing to hire somebody who's a single parent of a child with a disability, that could be considered discrimination. And, um, or, um, creating a hostile work. So this could be refusing to hire somebody also who has 
a spouse with a disability. It doesn't mean it's not just hire. It could be promotion. It could be you don't get the good you don't get the good opportunity for the raise. You don't get the good assignment that might provide you with an opportunity for promotion or a bonus. It's, it, this is especially true for women. And so there are over, it overlaps. So in our culture, very traditionally, women are the caregivers. And still, aside from the disability thing, right, rights issue under, if you look statistically, women are, are paid like 87% of what a man makes. It's just the way it is. And if you look in the, at the employment landscape of our country, those types of jobs that are traditionally held by women pay less than those types of jobs that are traditionally held by men. And if you also then overlap what type of job is this, you will see that the jobs that are traditionally held by women very often are caregiver jobs. And so there's an overlap there. And so you can pull in your rights under the, um, 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 the just the general disability rights the Civil Rights Act because you're being discriminated against on the basis of you're a woman, where maybe if you were a woman who is also a caregiver, then you don't get the opportunity for the promotion or you don't get the hire or you don't get the promotion. Um, but if you're a man who has a child with a disability or um, a spouse with a disability, they don't sort of attach that type of stigma to you. They don't automatically expect that you're gonna be the responsible person and you're the, gonna be the one who's gonna need to take time off work and they're gonna have to make accommodations for you. So there's overlapping, um, overlapping protection laws. Creating a hostile work environment. I'm going to back up just a minute to this one. And um, um, refusing to hire. How do you know? Like you applied for a job, right? And you didn't get hired. You were qualified for the job, and you didn't get hired. How do you know you were discriminated against? You can't call them and say, why didn't I get this job? Did you discriminate against me? That's not going to be how you're going to figure it out. So how do people make discrimination claims on the basis of the fact they were not hired to start with? And the, the, the law sets forth a, a, a prima facie case. That means on its face of it. You just look at the face of it and go, yeah, it looks like discrimination to me. And in order to get there, you have to make a connection. The legal term is nexus. You have to make a connection between what happened and what didn't happen. You applied for the job, you didn't get hired. So were you qualified for the job? If you were not qualified for the job, then you know, you, you, even if it was some kind of discrimination, you weren't qualified, you're not going to win. If you were qualified for the job, and they, if you apply for a job, and they don't hire you, and they keep on looking for somebody else, and you were qualified, that by itself is, is prima facie like, here I am, you wanted to hire somebody, I'm qualified for this job, I applied for this job, you said, no, thank you, I don't want to hire you, you must be discriminating against me. I fall into a protected class, you, that must have been the reason why you told me no and kept on looking. We call that a nexus. Subjecting a worker to severe and pervasive harassment. The term in here that's important is severe and pervasive. If your coworker you know, says something offhanded to you that's offensive, that's not severe and pervasive. In, um, so severe, there are many court cases that where the judges have had to rule on, well, does this behavior rise to the level of severe and pervasive? And basically, you have to have some kind of, I want to say emotional distress. It's an, you're not making a claim for infliction of emotional distress, but in reality, it has to be significant enough that the that the normal person would feel intimidated, would feel anxious, would have some workplace issues because of it. So that's severe and pervasive. And so this could be, um, but this can be, you know, being subject to to consistent negative comments from a supervisor or a coworker because you're taking time off of work to care for somebody. It's, it can be when people use language that is very, um, very unfriendly. Um, there are people out there, we don't like to think about it, but there are people out there that are not very understanding. It, many times it's people who've not had to suffer any kind of issues in their own family and they don't really understand. And um, maybe some burden is being put on them. They're having to work an extra shift or they're having to take up some extra piece of work that falls under normally a different job description and they're not happy about it. 
If that is happening to you, you have to complain through the process that your employer has provided for complaining. So you cannot win a claim for harassment, or for discriminatory harassment at work if your company has a policy of how to, uh, against it and has a process for how to complain about it. If you don't use their process and then you complain, the first thing that you get smacked in the face with is, why didn't you use the process to complain? Now, if the reason you didn't use the process to complain is because the person you would complain to is the person who's doing the harassing, then there should be a level above that of, well, what if this person is the, is the person who's doing the harassing? And if you're at the top of the chain, and, then, and that's the person that's doing the harassing, you're like, well, I still complain to the person, then you can go to the Civil Rights Commission, the Iowa Civil Rights Commission, because that's the first thing they're gonna ask you is did you use your policy? And also your employer can win. If you, if you did not use the policy, the employer defense is we have a policy for reporting, we can't be held responsible for that because they didn't use, they didn't report it and we didn't know enough about it to be able to fix it. So who is covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act? You have to have at least, under the federal rules, you have to have 15 employees that's an employer that would be covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act and not employed by a private club, a religious organization, or the U.S. Department of Transportation. The U.S. Department of Transportation has its own rules about discrimination and that's why they're exempt. Employers that are covered, not all employers are covered by the Family Medical Leave Act. For small employees, it can be quite burdensome for them to have to give employees time off or intermittent time off. So it's the private sector, if they have 50 or more employees um, and 20 or more work weeks in either the calendar year or previous calendar year. That means what they're trying to deal with here are the, the agricultural workers, like the farm workers that come in seasonally. So maybe you have 150 workers for only a few year, weeks of the year, but then the rest of the year you don't. And so that's why they do it that way. Um, the, um, federal agencies and local governments, they are um, covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, local, the local educational agencies um, um, are covered also, but they have some, the rules for the intermittent leave can be a little bit different for them. If you need leave at the end of the year and you want it to be intermittent, they may be able to tell you, no, it can't be intermittent, you just need to take the rest of the school year off. Um, employees who are covered. So just because the employer is covered by the FMLA doesn't mean you are covered by the FMLA. You have to have worked for at least a year for a company, which is really problematic for people. You kind of get stuck now. I can't quit my job because if I go to work for a new company and then I have to take leave, I'm not protected. Um, so you have to have worked at least 12 months and have had at least um, 1,250 hours of service during the 12 months before your leave starts. And your location has to have the 50 employees within 75 miles. Thank you. Oops, sorry. I was gonna change screens with my water bottle. That's not gonna work. Alrighty, so you have to have a qualifying condition. That means you need to be caring for a child, spouse, or parent who has a serious health condition. Then there are definitions of what is a serious health condition. Um, you also, there's leave related to, and this is the newer, they keep tweaking the family medical leave, and there are, there are laws for, um, uh, extra laws for if you're caring for somebody who is a service member. And um, um, you can get up to 12 weeks. The normal is 12 weeks of leave in a 12 month period. There, you can get up to 26 weeks um, for military caregiver leave during a 12 month period if you're caring for somebody who is, a, who is active duty or a veteran. However, it's only once. So if you have a chronic illness, it's like, well, you did it once, you can't have 26 more weeks for the same person. Do you have another relative you wanna take care of? Just kind of crazy. It's like, so this is, this is not intended for somebody who has a chronic long-term condition. It's intended for somebody who has just a single episode that needs some long-term assistance right away. Um, so, can you come back to work? So I've had employees who say, well, I'm ready to come back to work now. Can your employer tell you that you can't come back to work until you give me some certification that proves that you're able to come back to work? They can do that. Can they, do they have to give you back the same job that you had when you left? Not necessarily, but it needs to be the same quality and opportunity of jobs. So the same pay, 
the same opportunities for bonuses if you had opportunities for bonuses before, the same opportunities for advancement if you had opportunities for advancement before, um, and, and uses basically your same skill set. And they can't change your, benefit, your benefits. They can't go, oh, by the way, now you don't qualify for health insurance. So when you request leave, there are all kinds of rules follow up that, that surround the Family Medical Leave Act. You are supposed to ask in advance if you know in advance. Here's the thing. They can make you take FMLA leave even if you didn't ask for it. So if they know you're taking vacation in July, and they know the reason that you're taking vacation in July is because you're going to be caregiving for somebody that would qualify under the Family Medical Leave Act if you had asked. They can count that as part of your 12 weeks that you, that you used. So that, that's another one of those reasons why, you know, talking to people in the workplace about what your medical conditions are can be problematic for you because maybe you didn't intend on using those 12 weeks of Family Medical Leave, one of those weeks right now. Um, and here they've already, you've used up one of them. They can require you to take paid leave when you take medical. When you take FMLA, they can go, well, you know, I think you should use up your vacation time. They can do that. As what, what, and this, because this is from the employer perspective, this is the game that people play is, you know, I'm the employer. My employee comes to me and says, oops, sorry. Sorry, people online. Uh, my employee comes to me and says, I'm going to take vacation. I'm going to take my four weeks that I've saved up of vacation. So, okay, fine, good. And then they come back from the four weeks of vacation and go, oh, by the way, I'm injured and I need to take 12 weeks of family medical leave. And so now you've been gone for 16 weeks. And they can, so that's, that's one of the ways that family medical leave gets tagged clear back to the beginning. Oh, you took your first four weeks of vacation to have knee surgery, huh? And so they can require you to use up all kinds of paid leave that you have, whether it's workers' compensation, whether it's PTO, whether it's sick days, whatever paid leave it is you have, they can require that you use that up at the same time that you're using up your family medical leave. Congruently? At the same time, yes. So if you request family medical leave and you have two weeks of vacation saved up, they can say you have to, take vaca you have to use up your vacation pay during the first two weeks of your family medical leave. Yes, right. Yes, that's correct. So key employees. For some businesses, having a certain employee out for 12 weeks is like can be a death nail to the business. How are we going to survive? We have got to replace you. We can't do without your, somebody in your position. And so if you are a key employee, first off, your employer needs to let you know that you're a key employee. And um, um, this is kind of the definition of it, Ted paid, ten, paid with the highest 10%. Um, so you're in the higher pay bracket of how much do people get paid at this company. Um, and then um, they have to give you notice. And then they, what they can do if you say, well, I'm taking family medical leave anyway, they can refuse to reinstate you. So maybe they've replaced you and they go, you know what, we, we had to replace you. So you don't get to come back to work. You did lose your job. So that if you are in a high position at your employer, that's something to ask them about. Am I a key employee? If I were to need family medical leave, am I considered a key employee so that you know in advance? Shouldn't they be able to tell you in advance? Well, they, they only tell you in advance if you ask. Because otherwise they don't know you're a disability and they don't, most companies don't just have a routine policy of letting people know, oh, by the way, um, you're a key employee, so don't ask us for family medical leave. These are resources. They're, these are FMLA resources. The state of Iowa, do I have more? Yeah. The state of Iowa also has a civil rights, um, we have a civil rights act for the state of Iowa, and it covers smaller employees. You only have to have four employees who are not family members. So if there are six employees and three of them are family members, then, they're not, then you're not covered if you're one of those other, other employees that's not a family member. Um, so if you have four employees that are not family members, in a small business, then that small business is covered under the Iowa Civil Rights Act. The Iowa Civil Rights Act does not have family medical leave. So it's not the, the family medical leave is a federal program, not a state program. Although if you're a state employee for the state of Iowa, the state of Iowa employees do have a family medical leave, their own sort of little family medical leave policies and, and rules. And um, so, uh, this would be the discrimination thing. So if you feel like you are being discriminated against on the basis of either your disability or 
your um, affiliation, disability affiliation, then the Iowa Civil Rights Act is where you would eventually go to a plot to, to complain. So first you use your employer's process for complaining, and if you don't get relief that way, then you can go to the Iowa Civil Rights Act. You don't need a lawyer. This is designed to not use a lawyer to start with. You can go online, you fill out your form online, tell the Iowa Civil Rights Act what has happened, and then they will investigate, and they will try to figure out that your, your, your employer will be asked to respond to a whole bunch of questions, and, um, and then they make a determination, the Iowa Civil Rights Act, the Iowa Civil Rights Commission makes a determination of whether or not you have a legitimate case. And if you have a legitimate case, they'll try to fix it for you. And if they can't fix it for you, then they give you a right to sue letter. So unless you have a right to sue letter, if you go try to find a lawyer, you're probably not gonna find one. So to get to a lawyer to help you, you need a right to sue letter from the Iowa Civil Rights Commission, which you get whether they, you know, whether they decide, whether the Iowa Civil Rights Commission decides it is or it is not discrimination, they will still give you a right to sue letter. But it just, that proves that you used the administrative process before you're gonna use the court system. And so that's, that's what you need. Uh, it does not include people who are caregivers, in-home caregivers um, for family members. That doesn't, it doesn't include that. So, or, or in, if you work for an agency and you're an in-home caregiver, you're covered under your, and your company has four or more employees, then you're covered. But if you work for the family, directly for the family of somebody with a disability, then you're not covered under the, Amer under the Iowa Civil Rights Act for discrimination. Or if you work for a religious institution or it's educational facility or association or corporation or society with respect to blah, 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 you can see right there. Thank you very much. Okay, oh, this is how do you make a claim. So you go online to the Iowa Civil Rights Commission, make your claim, they'll do the investigation, and after a while they'll decide whether or not they think there was any discrimination, and, um, and then give you your right to sue letter, and then that's when you go to a lawyer if you haven't figured out how to work it out. One of the things, retaliation, this is the biggest area. So let's say that you complain to your employer that you're being discriminated against on the basis of disability, either your own disability status or the disability status of a care, as, as a caregiver, and um, they, they don't do anything about it. And so you're tooling along and you call and take the Civil Rights Commission, Civil Rights Commission investigates, and then the Civil Rights Commission says, oh, you don't really have a claim, here's your right to sue letter. But at work now, things have gotten bad. It's very hostile at work. People are upset with you for having filed a claim for discrimination, and now they are treating you badly. Now you didn't get the promotion. You didn't get the raise. They've changed your job hours. You're, you're experiencing negative employee, negative work consequences because you complained. That's called retaliation. It's illegal. Even if they were not, even if they really were not discriminating against you against the law, to begin with, now they are, because retaliation is, is bad. And most employers and most supervisors, people in management, lower level management positions, they don't know that. They don't know that it's illegal for them to treat you badly because you tried to enforce rights that you thought you had. And so now you go back to the Civil Rights Commission, you say I'm being retaliated against on the basis of having filed a claim for discrimination. And even if you don't win the discrimination claim, maybe you win the retaliation claim. I had a, for a very brief period of time, I was uh, working for a labor and employment defense firm in Omaha. And I had a, a business client who had a, um, a case. Um, I, there was a, a private person who had a case against this company in, in Wisconsin. And um, I was filing a motion for uh, um, declaratory judgment. That means that person didn't show up just say that we win. They didn't do what they were supposed to do, say we win. And his, his response was, um, I've got 14 lawsuits pending, I'm busy. You should, give me, you should give me a little bit of extra leeway. Here's all my 14 lawsuits I have pending because I've sued all of these companies. So what he does is he sues the company for not hiring him, so he had a criminal background. And in some states illegal, it's illegal to not hire somebody because of a criminal background, unless the criminal background is directly required to, directly connected to 
the reason. So if you if you have a criminal background of theft, then you know an employer can deny you employment in a, a, a job that requires you to handle money. But if it's something that doesn't have anything to do, where you don't have any opportunity to steal something, they can't hold that against you. And so he, he had filed, applied for jobs, got denied uh, uh, the job, and then um, up, reapplied for a job that he maybe could qualify for. But of course, the company didn't hire him because he's suing us. And so then he files his retaliation claim. And he had 14 claims pending in different states. And that was his reason for why um, we should, he should get extra time from the, from the judge to file his response is he was busy suing people. So people do that, it's, you know, I mean, you don't think about doing that. You don't, I mean, you don't, we don't think about that in terms, especially here in Iowa, we are Iowa nice people, you know, and somebody said no, we say okay, and we walk away. And um, that's not always what you should do. I mean, it, it, when, once you get involved in a lawsuit, it takes over your life, and I do not encourage people to get involved in lawsuits because now you're living and breathing this stupid lawsuit, and it's, it's impacting your ability to experience whatever joy there is in your life. So, oops, sorry, online people again. And uh, do not put the lavalier next to your next to your heart if you're a person that talks with your hands, I guess. Um, so, being denied future opportunities because you complained—that's retaliation, and it's illegal. Okay, we have about. 10 minutes left, how many minutes do we have left, Tom? About 10 minutes left. And um, I'm happy, very happy to take questions. There, were, there was another point that I wanted to make. I keep trying to run back to it in my brain. There was a point that I wanted to make, but I'm having, having difficulty uh, figuring out what it is. Does anybody have questions? Go ahead. That is, a, that is a really, really good question because COVID has affected so many things. And um, there are many cases where the laws have not caught up with the changes that are happening very quickly in our society. And um, I think um, the, the current, my current practice isn't employment law, so I don't have any real current experience to share with you with the work from home um, issue. And I don't, and I cannot answer that question for you. I'm sorry. Of how remote working has affected numbers of employees, um, and when I was doing my research to prepare for this, I did not run across. Um, I did not run across that. Um, the, so the EEOC has not issued any guidelines on that yet. Yes. I am very glad you asked, and that was the question. I would, that was the thing in the back of my mind. It's like, I need to talk about this. What can you do? So you can request a reasonable accommodation at your, at your work. If you have a disability, there's a system. Um, they don't have to give you the reasonable accommodation that you are asking for, for one thing. So you say, this is my limitation. You need, you need to prove that with a letter from your doctor. These are the limitations that this person has, whether it's uh, numbers of hours that you can work in a row, whether it's physical limitations like lifting things or standing or, or manual dexterity, manipulation of things. What are your limitations? And your employer, um, um, they, their limitation is, first off, is undue hardship. So if whatever accommodation, it, if there is no accommodation they can make for you that does not create an undue hardship, undue hardship is another one of those terms that's not defined by law, it's defined by the statute, it's defined by the case laws, people who have sued and the judges have said, yes, this is undue influence. Go ahead. Undue hardship on the company. Undue, hard, undue hardship on the company, yes. So if it's undue hardship on the, point, on the part of the company, then they don't have to make any accommodation at all if there's not something they can do that would accommodate you that doesn't create an undue hardship. Undue hardship means they have to change their business practice. It could mean that it's expensive for them. It's like they don't have to provide you with glasses or hearing aids, things that personal items they don't have to provide you with. But other safety equipment maybe they would have to provide you with depending on how expensive the safety equipment is. And um, if you ask, they potentially you could get um, a change in work hours you could get a change in um, your job responsibilities. 
if they, one of the things that they really drill into the HR people's heads is have good job descriptions. Because if it's an essential function of your job, if the thing that you cannot do is an essential function of your job, then, um, and they cannot make an accommodation so that you can still perform the essential function of your job, then they may be able to say, no, we don't have to make, an, we don't have an accommodation we can make for you. Um, they can move you to um, a different shift. They can move you to a different job. Um, I had a client once who wanted, she had a knee problem. It was a chronic knee problem. She needed knee surgery. She wasn't ready to have knee surgery. She worked in a gas station, like a Casey's kind of thing. And um, what she wanted was a stool behind the counter so that she could just sit when there wasn't anybody at the cash register, she could take the weight off of her foot. And they would not put a stool there. They, they said, no, can't, we're not gonna do that. We want people standing at the cash register. We're not gonna put a stool there for you. That was a reasonable accommodation. They should have done that and she won that case. That was just stubbornness on the part of the company. Why not? So one of the things that you hear from, that you will hear from the HR department is if we do that for you, we have to do that for everyone. I'm pretty sure my mother invented that excuse. And if I buy that for you, I have to buy one for all the kids. So that's wrong. And where that comes from is that there are the laws that set it out. There are the, so it gets very complicated from here, and I'm sorry, I get kind of passionate about this, but there are the laws, like the things that are in writing that the legislature passes. That's just a small piece of what is used to make the rules. The rest of it is case law. So people who have complained, and if it makes it up to the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court, now we have, what do the judges say? And every case is fact specific. What were the facts in this case? And so then we have case law. So as an attorney, when you go to try to figure out, is this a reasonable accommodation or is this not a reasonable accommodation? What should this company do for this person? The thing that we go to is we look at the case law and go, well, can we find a case with similar facts and what, what did the judge say? Was that reasonable or not reasonable? What the, the human resource people are taught by the attorneys who do this is, as attorneys, um, sometimes they get a little bit arrogant and think they know a lot and they think you don't know a lot and you're not gonna do what we think you should do, so we're gonna teach you how to do it in a very conservative way. If you do it for one person, you have to do it for everybody. And that way, you won't make the mistake of being able to discern which person should you do it for and which person shouldn't you do it for. If my mother buys me a bra, she does not have to buy one for my brother because I needed one and he didn't. And the same thing is true in the workplace. They have to treat people who have similar situations in similar ways, but they do not have to do the exact same thing for every person. So for example, in my office, I have, a work, I have an, one employee who works full time from home. But not, that does not mean that all my employees get to work full time from home. It depends on the employee's job description for one thing, and also depends on what my company needs are. I need somebody in the office so that when people come to the office, there's someone there. And so everybody can't work remotely. And so you will encounter this. Well, we can't do it for you because if we do it for you, we have to do it for everybody. They don't. They don't have to do it for everybody. Your needs, they have to, they have to be fair. The rules, the basic grounding of the rules is you have to be fair. And so if you're giving a reasonable accommodation to, if you're giving a reasonable accommodation to a, a, a woman who's pregnant and she needs to sit down during the day so you give her a chair, then the man who has the knee problem and needs to sit down every once in a while, you probably need to give him a chair too. Because they both have sit down needs. They're not both having a baby, but they both have sit down needs. And so, what is fair? And your employer does not have to give you what I started out with is whatever reasonable accommodation you want, that's not the one they have to give you. If they can come up with a different one, they can give you the different one. And then you have the argument of, is this a reasonable accommodation? They say, you say, I want a chair. And they say, we're not gonna give you a chair. We'll give you a 10 minute break once an hour. And you go, that's, that's really not gonna do it for me. Well then, now you have a dispute. Is the 10 minute break once an hour enough reasonable accommodation? Or is it, the, is it the chair, or is it something else? And so negotiating with your employer is a good way to do it. Yes? So in your reasonable accommodation uh, attempts or whatever, is it uh, possible or likely or does it happen that the employer will come back, we'll, we'll make you a teleworker, but then because you're a teleworker, we'll pay you less? Um, typically, no. So a reasonable accommodation um, 
will usually comes along with something that is at the same pay grade as the grade that you're at. They can offer that to you. I mean, you can accept it. it this is a, you know, they can say, well, we can't make a reasonable accommodation for you in the job that you're in now. We can offer you a different job that pays less. They could do that. So, um, um, and then that's your choice if you want to accept it or not. But the, the, um, they're protected if they've done that. So it's a hard thing. It's the first thing I would encourage you to do is become very familiar with your um, employee handbook. And is your employee handbook a contract? Does your employer have to honor everything that they said they were going to do in that handbook? Do you have to do everything that you're supposed to do according to the handbook? You can guess by the way that I'm presenting this. The answer is no, right? Yeah. So we draft handbooks on purpose. If you look in your handbook, there's somewhere in there it says this is not a contract and the employer can change this anytime they want to and they don't have to let you know that they changed it. I'll bet you $100 that that's in there somewhere. It's not a contract. Then why do they have you sign it? This drives me crazy because it's not a contract. And when you, when you get a new handbook, do they go, here's our new handbook. Please take two hours to read it, understand it, and ask us questions. And then sign this paper that says, I have read this handbook and understand it and had an opportunity to ask questions. Do they do that? No. They say, here's your handbook, sign here. And then do they give you a copy of the thing that you signed that says, yes, I've read and understood this handbook? No, they do not. Always ask. If somebody asks for, this is outside our scope now, if somebody asks for your signature on some piece of paper, you ask for a copy of it because there's a reason why they're asking for your signature. And it's better for you, if they're going to have a copy of your signature, you should have a copy of your signature. So if you sign something, say, can I have a copy of that? That's just general advice to, to give. But, so your employer handbook can change any time. Your employer does not have to follow it if they don't want to. They can hold you to the rules and they can change the rules. That's allowed. Um, under the employment laws that we have and that's one of the reasons why we have unions is because then when you have a union contract then the employer also gets stuck to having to abide by these rules that they've negotiated with the unions. Mm -hmm. Well good luck to you all. I don't do employment and labor law work. If you do have a problem in your workplace, discrimination problem in your workplace, you can still call me even though I don't do that. I have a list of attorneys that do that kind of work and we would refer you to someone that does that kind of work. All right, thanks.